Welcome, Thank Kevin. You. I want to talk about the Brave New World as being an opportunity for humans to improve ourselves by linking much more closely with technology, to give ourselves extra abilities. So this is linking the biology of the human directly with technology to form cyborgs, cybernetic organisms, part human, part machine, part biology, part technology. And what I want to do is to share three experiences, three experiments, and to talk about what, what it might feel like in the future, because we're all going to be cyborgs in the future. You've got to, get, have to like it. So what will it feel like? To try and give you some idea through my own experiments. So the first one is now biohacking. And this is really perhaps the, the entry level to, to cyborgs. And what I actually had, this is um, a younger version of me uh, with my, my doctor, and what he's doing is putting a little implant in my left arm as, as an identification device. What it actually looks like is this, not, not the thing on the left-hand side, um, this is on the right hand side is the, the implant which is an identification and, and what it does is identify me to the computer in my building so the computer knows where I am at different points and then does things for me. So what it did as I walked towards my laboratory the door opened for me automatically as I walked down the corridor the lights came on and coming through the front door it said hello Professor Warwick. It's, you know. It's, it's really cool stuff. You've got to go with it. Um, now, you know, for, for me, I think one of the things I learned straight away, the experience, is that when you have an implant, mentally you feel it's part of you. It's, it's the same as if you have a cochlear implant for hearing. You, you just think of it as being you, or artificial hips. So it's not like a pair of glasses, which I do have. You put, pick them up and put them down. When you have an implant, it's part of you. So as you walk, for me, as I was walking around with this implant, the things were happening for me, not for this piece of technology. Now, I don't know, does anybody here, this is hand raising time, have a cat or a dog? with a chip implanted. I, I can, yeah, thank you. it's all right, don't be scared. You got me scared. Um, yeah, so there's quite a few hands going up. Thank you very much. You can feel happy that your, oh, thank you, the late hand there. You can feel happy that your pet is really keyed up, ready for the future. And, <laughs> and that um, this technology was fully tested on humans before your animal <laughs> received it. Let's go to experiment number two. And this is something a little bit different to what I've been talking about. Big opportunity for humans, this one. And that is taking, what we do in experiments, take brain cells, typically from rats, because rats are not particularly popular, or, or from, from humans, which is quite possible. And you see there, there's a, it's a little plate that has electrodes on the bottom. That's how we can send electrical signals and pick up electrical signals. The black rings are where we take brain cells, which we separate first with enzymes, and we put the brain cells in that little, those little black rings. The black rings are there to stop it dehydrating, because these are living brain cells. When you put them there, very quickly, they start to connect up. Brain cells love to communicate. That's what brain cells do. And we use that for, we have to feed them. We keep it in an incubator at 37 degrees centigrade. And after about 10 days, we have so many connections, we can look at the pathways through the brain and we give it a body, essentially, a little robot body. And what you're gonna see now, I'll click on, we'll see the first video. Oh, that's, a, that's where we connect up, little black rings I'm talking about and so on. Um, and we, we've got a little robot now with a biological brain, hopefully. In the oh, yeah. That's it. And what the robot is supposed to do is with ultrasonic sensors, like a bat senses the world, to detect the wall and then change direction. But the direction change is purely through its biological brain. And then... Because it's just a baby, it's just started out, sometimes it's not supposed to crash. We don't want that. Now, this robot, the brain, has about 100,000 or 150,000 brain cells. 
So it's, it's reasonable size. And what we're looking at in the experiment is to try and get it to learn how to move around without bumping into the wall through habit. Simply one hour every day in the laboratory. And we'll look now. This, this was the robot after about 10 days. You can see it bumps into the wall sometimes and so on. We're now looking at the same robot, the same brain. This is a biological brain making the decisions after two months. So what this robot has been doing is moving around in the corral for two months to try and learn not to bump into the wall. And we can investigate under the microscope how the pathways change, how they strengthen, due to habit. It's, it's very much like if you're driving the same route day after day. You, you almost do it as though you're programmed in the end. It's, it's purely through habit. And the passageways in the brain become so strong, that's what you do. And you see this one, it's a little bit boring in a way. It detects the wall and it turns and things like that. They're not all this good. But now let's take the next step. I said 100,000 brain cells. We can also grow the brains in three dimensions, which takes the number up to about 60 million brain cells. So what we're talking about now is 60 million human brain cells in a robot body. Let's take it to give you an opportunity in the future. Humans have 100 billion brain cells. You know, what, what would it be like for you to have your brain in a robot body? that if something went wrong with it, you can replace it. If some, you, know, you want it a bit faster or slower or you want it to be something different, you can replace it. What, what the opportunities there are absolutely enormous. That's what we're looking at here, possibilities of changing your body. It's a bit, little bit. We're not far from where Kafka is buried in Glorious Zhishkov as well. So it's very Kafka-esque that you can change what body you've got and so on. I mean, we, we could even have English robots with, with brain cells like this. Whether they would be um, silly enough to vote for Brexit and things like that, I, I don't know. <laughs> but there's the future for us. Experiment number three, the, the brain gate. Something different again. And uh, this particular one was looking at, there's me on the operating table, two hours of neurosurgery to have an implant. I, this was not for medical purposes. It wasn't for therapeutic. To didn't have a medical problem. This was in order to scientifically investigate the possibilities of the implant. What the implant looked like, this is the brain gate implant, the sensor side of things. It's 100 spikes that you can see. And this was fired into the nervous system in my left arm. This is what the operation was all about to link my nervous system with the computer and hence onto the internet, which is a big advantage. The internet's very useful for this sort of thing. Now, to give you some idea of the sort of experiments I was able to do with my nervous system connected to the internet, the first one, humans have a very limited sensory range. We, we, if you, even the visual spectrum, we, we sense hardly any frequencies at all. So let's expand it. Let's sense more things. Let's understand the world around us. Let's perceive what's going on in a much broader spread. This was looking at ultrasonics. So I've got a blindfold on. I've got ultrasonic sensors on the baseball cap. And what is happening as an object comes closer, you can see Ian, the researcher, brings the board a bit closer. Pulses of current were essentially stimulating, via my nervous system, stimulating my brain so that the closer an object came, the more pulses. So it's quite simple. Ding, 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 ding. Something's coming close. Ding, ding, ding. It's further away. What did it feel like? Well, it felt like something was coming close. It's an ultrasonic sense. It was not painful or anything like that. Your brain is actually quite a clever device, and it can make sense of what's going on. It can be fooled, but it can make sense of what's going on. One thing that I, I found amazing about this, Ian, at one time, just for fun, so he thought, suddenly brought the board towards me. I didn't know that, what he was doing. All, all I had was an ultrasonic. It was scary. And I thought, well, it was almost like a reaction which it had taken about six weeks to train my brain to recognize these pulses. And then this happens, and it's like a reaction coming out of it. Really weird, I felt. This is my, my wife. I, I, I was going to say, and get this right, Moya Krasna Manjelka. But... <laughs> But 
But so, but I, but I realised that's because Krasner, the title Krasner and Brave. I, I don't know. It's a different meaning. So I hope I didn't insult her or anything. Now she's she's wearing some jewellery that a student at the Royal College of Art in London put together, and the jewellery changes colour between red and blue, it was linked to my nervous system. Remember the implant in my nervous system. So now, just to set the scene for the storyline here to give you one idea, because once, you, once you're on the nervous system, you can measure all sorts of what I'll call the physical emotions. So, so I'm not thinking in terms of love, and th which is, you know, what, what is it, and things like that, scientifically speaking, but in terms of anger and shock, and th there's lots of research going on in different parts of the world in terms of how do you measure it in terms of somebody's brain or nervous system. So, in this case, if I was calm, this is set the scene now, if I was calm and, ex and, and settled down and so on, my wife's jewellery was blue, and if I got excited, then the jewellery started flashing red. Now, there she is. She doesn't, doesn't work in the, the university at the same place at all. And the jewellery is blue. Fine. He's not doing anything he shouldn't, and so on. And then the jewellery starts flashing red. What is he doing? And more importantly, who is he doing it with? <laughs> I think this relates to the talk about three talks ago, I think. Um, so, there we go. Emotions. This... Now this, I think for me, was one of the most mind-blowing bits. This was taken at Columbia University, which is New York, and what we did, with the help of the guys there in the real-time computing lab, linked my nervous system on the internet to a robot hand, which was in Reading University in the UK, near London. So when I opened and closed my hand in New York, it also, it's like having a third hand, opened and closed the robot hand in England. So essentially my brain signals, we were tapping in to the, with the electrodes in my nervous system, tapping into my neural signals. Okay, they do that with my hand, they're doing it now. But also they were opening and closing the robot hand on another continent. And when the hand gripped an object, we took sensory signals from the fingertips, fed it back across the internet to stimulate essentially stimulate my brain again, by my nervous system. So my brain was getting the same pulses of current, the same things, more pulses dependent on how much force the robot hand was applying. And the experiments, what I was trying to do was to open and close my hand, which opened and closed the robot hand, so it just gripped an object, because I was getting the feedback from the... Now that, the same experiment has since been used for therapeutic purposes in the US to help people who are paralyzed directly in the motor cortex, but for me it was like an extra robot hand. And also, the big thing, that you can have your brain in one place and your body can be wherever you want. Your brain and body don't have to be in the same place. That's how we've evolved to now, but you know, why stick with what we've got? Let's go with something new. And this is an opportunity. And your body can be anything. Your body can be arms and legs, but it can be buildings, it can be cars, it, you know, whatever you want your body to be, that's what it can be. The last part of the experiment, again, involved my wife, and she had, uh, I think Czechs are very brave. This is where she is, the other crowds in a bit, brave. And she had electrodes pushed into her nervous system, two electrodes, without anaesthetic, now, if you try it, you're, it's very painful. And the doctor, we, we, we thought the doctor was going to give some anaesthetic. And he said, no, 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 I need to make sure I've made a good contact. So he pushed an electrode in, and she screamed. And the doctor said, yeah, I think we've made a good contact there. <laughs> he, he pushed another electrode in, and we went back to the lab and linked, electronically linked our nervous systems together. So when she closed her hand, my brain received a pulse. Chook, 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 chook. So it was like a telegraphic communication, nervous system to nervous system. And clearly, where we're heading is not just nervous system. Nervous system, brain to brain, communicating by thought. This old-fashioned way of communicating something for the past, we're going to be communicating just by thinking to each other in the future. So, you will all be cyborgs in the future. We will all be able to communicate just by thinking to each other. And I would like to be the first, therefore, to welcome you to TEDx Prague 2035 as a cyborg. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you.